Hey, what's up guys? It's your boy Days, and you're about to watch Thorin rant for about three hours. By the way, as you said, this is where it was a very interesting point in your career because what's funny is I've even made a video. It was actually called like players I was wrong about. I actually said I was wrong and you were one of the ones I listed specifically for the LDLC period the year before when you were at the major and stuff because the problem is in that time period, even though your team was on the rise, like the names weren't as big in your team so people didn't focus in in the same way. So for example, in that team, I can tell you right now, everyone just looked and they were like, oh, well, there's happy guys were but I thought fucking hell, oh, Apex always loved his game and it's more like that. You kind of got mixed in, in the bunch as it were then you came to the team we're talking about with the dual snipers you have K, fucking Kaylee and Kenny S who were both going crazy so at the time like you say the joke was people would watch them dominate you might have like 10 kills and then they'd go is he even doing anything? He's just being carried. And then the second that Kaylee left and then everyone's whole thing is like, right, who's going to help Kenny S? Everyone, me included, you're the person that we scapegoated. We all just said, right, this fucking guy's got killing. Look, he's the one cost him the game. But the joke was, actually, there was a time period around the spring, fully enough around this op nerf, where actually you had like a little optic. So what I want to ask is this. Was there an aspect within this team where you ever had a slump? Was there any reason you think why people were sagging you? How did you handle it? Because back then, you were never a guy who'd ever lash out like players do nowadays. But I know you obviously couldn't have. It's not enjoyable. It's not nice to be the one that people are mm. saying it's all your fault or you're not. You shouldn't be in the... That's the other one I know tilts people. It's when they say you shouldn't be in this team. You should kick you, essentially. How did you handle that? Um, uh, well, I, I have to revisit sort of the emotional landscape that I had at the time. Um, one of the first things that I would say is that Compared to the person that I am now, I was way weaker mentally at the time that okay. I am now in, in terms of letting myself fall into uh, sort of a vicious cycle when the game starts badly and I'm not finding my shots. And I was also, as I alluded to in the first part of this episode, I was way too vulnerable to people expressing frustration and being mad around me. And this would get to me. And so I think... I sometimes revisit this period of my life and I'm thinking, I wish I had been stronger to be able to sort of shut off like Apex raging or Kenny S raging because even though even though it's obviously not ideal from them to do that and it is it is not a, a healthy or a functional way to behave as a, as a player in Counter-Strike or whatever, I agree on that. It is still, it would have still been on me to deal with it better and to just say, you know what, I don't care about these guys. I'm going to keep playing with my game. I'm going to do what I got to do and just focus on it. I, I was not really capable of doing that. So um, I think there were moments where when the team was was kind of falling down, I wasn't really able to to carry it myself because I would let it come to me. And then I think the, the, the late 2014 entrance of 2015 was really rough for me. Like individually, I wasn't good. I did not feel good. I did not feel comfortable. Um, and... A part of it was also because I was a player, and also I think it's a sign of weakness, but that's who I was. I, the, the more certain and serene my team was, the better I was. So when we knew what we were doing and everything was in position and I knew what was happening, I had sort of a need to understand the rounds that we were playing. And I had this problem as a player, which is a problem, that if we were making a call that I knew was wrong, I wasn't able to go through with it fully because I knew it was wrong. So like Flusher has this like very uh, famous quote where he says, you know, if you're going to do something stupid, just believing it is better right. than not do anything. Sure. I wasn't capable of it. I was not capable of it. If we were if we were calling a rotation, if we were calling a retake, and I was very certain that this was a bad idea for XYZ reason, I was going half-assed into it, and I was obviously getting my ass kicked because if you, if you go half-assed into a strategy, there's no chance you're going to win it. So there was a bunch of flaws that I had. As a player, I also think that my my training, uh, my practice on an individual level was not what it should have been. It's it's much later in my career that I started doing, for example, headshot only deathmatch, which helped me tremendously in terms of skill. Um, I wasn't exactly at the very top of that, so I have. It was a rough period. I also referred um, in in the first episode that we did, or the first part rather, that I had an anxiety issue that I was dealing with, uh, and at the time it was hitting me pretty hard. And I just think sort of the, a lot of elements in my life culminated into me not being able to deal with things the proper way um, and I did what I could I don't exactly have regrets it was the best that I could possibly do but the, this um, situation that I talked about being a player studying <coughs> a, ma a master degree at the same time and being an intern for a company uh, it burned me it burned me out uh, completely like you have to imagine I'm when we do EACA I'm literally 
I'm flying out of Dallas and I'm studying for an exam as we're flying from Dallas and I land and I'm going to a university to do an exam. So I'm, I'm nine hours behind on, on jet lag. I'm landing, I'm going straight to university, I'm doing an exam, going to my room, then crashing. Um, and I mean, it, it's not an excuse because I decided to do that. It was always my decision to say, I'm going to finish my studies first. But I was just not capable of doing better. So I would say late 2014 to entrance 2015 was very rough for me individually. And I think even though I was probably a little bit scapegoated in a way, I still think my performance was not up to par to be right. a be in the top five or top 10 team in the world. It just wasn't. That's a fact. And even though there were some other things that I was bringing up to the team, I, I'm, I'm a broadcaster right now. I know how that works. Like there's only so much you can do to save a player that's yes. not delivering. And I wasn't delivering. Um, so that that was rough. And then if I have any regrets, well, we can touch on it later, but if I have any regrets, they, they come later when Shucks and Smith join the team. Yes. By the way, I did have one quick question on when you were bringing that up there, which is if you could do it again, which would you choose? Would you take the year off CS and finish the studies? Would you take a sabbatical from the studies and maybe come back a year later? What do you think you would choose if you could do it over? So if <laughs> the, the problem is at the time and how esports is, is uh, sort of evolving, there is no way of knowing where we're going, right? True. It's very uncertain. Now, if if I had the technology to come back in time and I knew that esports was going to become what it is now and, and take the, the sort of the, the magnitude that it's taken, I would have said, okay, I, I can put my, my study on break for a while. I can put, right. I put it on pause. I'm going to put way more energy and I'm going to use that energy more efficiently into gaming and I'm going to have a healthier lifestyle as well because it was it was very unhealthy. Like When I say I had 100 hours per week of work, it's... It's an accurate number between practice and university and work. Uh, my work was a was a fifty percent work. So in Switzerland, that represents twenty two to twenty three right. hours a week. We call it part time, so, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a fifty percent part time job that I had. Um, it was unhealthy. It was very unhealthy for me to do all of that in order for things to be balanced, and that definitely played wasn't in my favor. Didn't play in my favor in my performance. So if I could give myself. Uh, the Titan jersey again, but with actual all my time uh, sort of dedicated to being better, to becoming better, then I would do it. Yes, I would. Just just in a curiosity of what could have had happened. Like, could I have been better? Could have we been better? What if I had actually that extra 10%, 20%, 30% level? Could, would we have one more? And then would Apex and Kenny go to Envious? Because at the time, that made a whole lot of sense for them. Sure. Yeah, there is a lot of questions that come, but I think... Where I am now in my life is such a, a blissful position that in one way, shape or form, I, I'm okay with whatever path I've been on because the end result now is, is one I'm very happy with. This was the year that sadly, as the number one existence fanboy in the world, broke me. Because before that, I always had a good excuse. Here's how it went at the Majors Maniac. The first Major, they ran into NIP. That was the second best team in the world. They lost them. It was still a close game. Okay, that's fine. He's still in the semifinals of the Major. The one after that was the kind of Itza one where they had that infamous story where behind the scenes they all studied all the teams and then the joke was it was Smith's job to study Hellraiser specifically on Inferno and then he might have you know phoned it in and then maybe he didn't know like some of the stuff they were going to do which is just kind of like that's a comedy of errors example because basically people don't know existence had tried to like plan the whole fucking like he, he essentially like, tried to make like a theory of Counter Strike where you had like every map like 50 strats like, and he just went too far after that you might remember when they got Kenny S back that was the one where they just Cloud9 went off Cloud9 and Dignitas were really good teams at the time they beat them that's a group you can lose in but the problem is when you come to this next year you have two majors and you don't have the same team and the first one you have Kenny S and Apex and the second one you have fucking um, Shocks and Smiths yeah Shocks and Smiths so the problem is when you when the only consistent aspect is existence in all these teams, I had to just take it on the chin because the first one people might remember, the story of the same majors is the same. It's being up in winning positions and everything collapsing. So yeah, the first one, yeah. it was obviously the one against your rivals, Envious. You had them right in position to beat them, lost, and then banged out immediately by Pence in a game that should never happen. Then in the next one with Shocks and the other one, that was the one where you beat an NIP. It's like, like, holy shit. And remember, NIP is like another rival. This is going to be baller if they win this. And then they not only blow that, like that's one of the craziest meltdowns I've ever seen where existence had like the worst record ever on a map in that Dust 2 game. I think it had like one kill or something mental. Like, I think it was like one in 17. So like when I saw these ones, I know the stories of this guy. I've seen I've seen as a, someone who knows tactics what he was doing in the other games and not at majors. He was a very brilliant in-game leader. And the joke is, now that enough years have passed that he's not so associated with my name, everyone gives it up to him now. Even all the people in interviews like, yeah, he was really great as Nigel. But at the time, everyone was just like, 
And I've even heard the players like this. This guy is fucking cursed. If you take him to a major, <laughs> it, it, the joke is he may as well not be there. Something happens. It's almost like he's shell shocked or something, and it just he isn't there, and it just goes. Can you give me some thoughts? Was there some sort of a curse or something that happened at major specifically? I, I don't, I don't think curse is the right word, but I do think there was an element of of self fulfilling prophecy and a very visible lack of trust and confidence when we were getting into these moments. Because you're you're right. The description is correct. Both these majors, although with different lineups, play out the same way, which is an almost very good result in a winning position that goes to hell, followed by a catastrophe of any shape or form against a team we should win. And I think at this point in time, I myself am not really impacted by it. I mean, obviously, I'm frustrated that we didn't win that game versus Envious on Cobblestone, which is almost impossible to lose. Somehow, we found a way to lose it. And then uh, the, the Navi overpass as well on, uh, in Cologne. It's very frustrating. But I'm when we move into the next game, I think I'm, I'm in a good headspace. Like, I'm okay. But I, I think existence probably has like the ghost of the previous majors being failed that's coming in. And yeah, it's it's hard for me to to judge his behavior and his calling style because I don't remember precisely, but I do remember a feeling of uh, people being concerned and worried and under pressure as you're playing. And this is very distinct. And for the joke is, I actually felt that in Vitality here, God and Katowice, I know exactly how it is. Right. I know, I know when I see a team that's in that mode, just yes. because I have been a player and I have been in professional games that have high stakes, I know when I see a team that is not ready to deal with whatever pressure of the matchup that's happening. They're, they're they're playing in their own they're playing their own match. They're not even on the server. They're playing against themselves. We had these moments for sure, and that's Penta. That's a complete meltdown against Penta on cash, which is supposed to be a good map for us. Yes. And we usually do 16 to 4. Like we do 16 to 4 to Penta. I mean, no dig against them, but we're supposed to be three times the Absolutely. team they are. Complete, complete meltdown, same in Cologne. And it is it is truly first and foremost in the head. Um, you can maybe argue that with Chucks and Smiths, we didn't have a whole lot of preparation because the move had been throughout the summer. Yeah, yeah. Sure. You can you can maybe argue here that the lack of prep didn't help us, and I guess there is a case to be made. But in Katowice specifically, it's just a men it's a mental breakdown. That's what it is. Like we were in, in terms of the quality of the games we were playing, like when you see how we, we lead against Envious, we, we could have been like a top eight team at this event, but we just completely crumbled uh, after that loss. Um just not being able to bounce back. I also think people don't realize that the format and the schedules were different than now. Like it's not like you were playing one game and then you were going back to the hotel and you had a moment to regroup with your with your boys yes. and talk it through. And then oh, okay, let's everybody get a good night's sleep. We're gonna come back. It's gonna get better. Sometimes you would play two games the same day. So if you're having a bad moment and you don't have sort of the the mental capacity of resetting and and entering the next game in a better mindset, then you can basically have one bad day in the office and be out. But I don't think it's an excuse. I think it was mostly. Um, Psychologically, we were too fragile at yes. the time. Oh, yeah, by the way, you are right. I was mixing up close the park with that one. It was Navi that you lost to in the big close. Yeah, game. Navi, yes, yeah. That was the one where, again, if you win that one, who knows? But then it goes the other way. Mm -hmm. and, it goes to, and obviously, the joke is at the time, look, here's where I'll actually reference. I never normally would because it's a fucking irrelevant game. But the joke, Chad, is the real reason why that is an important game. It's because who the fuck loses to random Australians at a major? Like, that's the I ultimate know. iniquity, mate. Like, the joke is at that point in time, like, you're, even though for Chad, it's the best moment of his life, the joke is all the Titan guys are like, what am I doing? It's just even the career for me can i am i even good at this game it makes you like question everything when you lose to like essentially randoms right <laughs> yeah the problem is it's very reminiscent of penta in a way like, right i think we, we can almost see the car crash coming and that's that's part of the reason why i'm saying we're weak mentally because if you are at the time if you're actually strong and stable you're able to to move past that idea but when we're in cologne i think kevin and i we have some of flashbacks of Katowice when we almost made it against right. uh, NVS and then we lost to Penta and now we're starting this right. Mirage game and and uh, I thought okay, it was Vox Eminor it was in Vox Eminor at the time I can't remember which team it was Renegades I'm not sure if it was Vox Eminor or Renegades no Renegades but they, yeah. they were Renegades and they they start playing this like fast CS with a lot of fakes and it is typically a play style that works against people who aren't exactly good on comms and are a little bit lost and it's exactly what's happening like the game is too fast for us like we can't right. keep track we can't keep track of what the hell is going on. We're getting fake left, right, center. People are screaming around. Everyone is tense. And yeah, that's that's how you play against a team that is not stable and confident. That's exactly what you need to do. They did what they had to. And yeah, for us, it felt just like, what the fuck? Who are we losing to? Like, what is going on? But self-inflicted. 
So as you say, obviously this was after the second French shuffle where Kenny S and Apex went to the envious team, which was the big dogs who took the best players basically. And in return, because of the mutiny within their team, you got Shocks and Smiths. Now at the time, even though everyone was already memeing on Smiths, Shocks was still known as a very good player. In fact, yeah. he even sort of at the end of that team, that's why he did a mutiny. He actually sort of come back to form. He was really good again. So at the time I remember thinking, hey, there's something to this. Like, you know, it's a, let's not just, you know, throw a, a, like all hopes away because Kenny S has gone. Maybe they can make this work here. And also, these are also players that played in existence. So, and RPK is there. If anything, the joke is aside from you. It's like a very games reunion. Like, maybe this can work. Maybe they can sort of get the team player working. Right, you said earlier, so I assume I'm going to set you up for it now. This is where you have your regrets. Because obviously, they initially made this team and then it wasn't that long. It was a few months. And then basically, they just kicked you and got screamed. They just did like a cynical yeah. move to go and like another very games player. Right? Was this something could have been done differently? What, what's the regret that you have? What, what was the the wrong um, you think? So the regret that I have is, I mean, it's re regret might not be the right term, but I wish I could do it over and do it over differently. But in for context, um, I said I had this year, right, where I was studying, uh, playing and working at the same time. So when summer 2015 comes around the corner, I'm basically finishing my degree. I just have my thesis that I need to validate and I'm going to do that in January 2016. So it's not too much stress. I'm basically done with my study. And um, at the time, one of the professor of the university that I'm going to is uh, offering me uh, the partner line, so I'm off offering me a job in their company to, to being a consultant with them and eventually being part of the members of or partners rather uh, of the company, which is a it's a huge job offer because also on a personal level, he is one of the few mentors uh, that I've had in my oh, life. Right. As someone okay. called Mauro Minelli, he's like his his presence and charisma and his intelligence and how he would pre he would present the classes he would get me like very much hooked in what he was saying and i i held him as a like a, a mentor figure and i went to work at his company and i worked there for a year and then at the end of that year they offered me a job uh, and it was a very pivotal moment in my life cuz i had a i didn't know where esports was going to go but i had a very concrete and practical offer in a very prestigious company in Switzerland that would guarantee me a, a, an incredible path, professionally speaking. And I decided to go with CS. <laughs> now, I don't regret my choice because, because Lord, where I am now, my life is absolutely beautiful. Oh, sure. So I have no regret on that. But what actually happened was that when Shocks and Smith join, I am mentally at the end of my rope in terms of discipline and work ethics. I am at the end of it. I... I don't even know how I can put it in different words. Just mentally speaking, I don't have the energy anymore to do what's right and to not do what's not right. And I am basically more looking forward to fucking partying and getting shit faced than I am to practicing. <laughs> okay. It's just, I'm just yeah, at just the end. Yeah, just some like, stress, right? Yeah, sure. It's just, it, I'm really at the end. I'm, I, I, now that I look back and now that I have the knowledge that I have, I was literally clinically burned out. Like right. I, 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 was, I just didn't have it anymore in me. I didn't want to, I mean, not that I didn't want to practice, but I wasn't really completely into it. I wasn't invested in any way. I wasn't trying to think, okay, how can I, how can I up my game? What can I change in what I'm doing? I basically just got myself carried in a backpack when Trucks and Smith joined. And I mean, they were really good company as well to go out. So this is like the famous French scene right. going out, having fun. But the problem is you can only do that if you're goddamn good at the game and you are still maintaining your end of the bargain. I wasn't. So I was just bad. I was just playing bad and I was not being a good teammate. And I wish I could go back and be in a different mindset, but I just, I was not capable of doing more than that. I just, I had given too much for too long and I, I just mentally speaking, I was empty. I was at the end of it. So when they... When they kicked me right before Cluj, I mean, it 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 was a it was a hurtful decision, but I, I couldn't even make a case against that. I just said, yeah, you know what, I I understand. I mean, why why would you want to play? It's not that I was really bad. I wasn't really bad. I was average playing, and I I mean, Q two and Q three of, of twenty fifteen, I'm I'm pretty decent at what I do. But why the hell would I want to play with someone like that who shows no interest in like improving, uh, being constructive about the game, going out ahead and looking for new ideas, looking for new tips, bringing in good energy, positive energy to the game? I was just like kind of just there and, oh, yeah, we're, we're in Dubai. Okay, let me just Google what kind of clubs they are here. Oh, I found this place. Like, let's go there. Right. It's just it was very logical that they would remove me. I would have removed myself. That's just so I, I that's why I say regret is not the best term because I 
if I was actually magically going back in time, I don't think I could have done much more than that. It's just that there comes a time where I, I, I pulled on the rope for too long. And when I let go, when I decompressed from finishing my master and uh, turning off my job offer and I started playing, I just didn't have it in me anymore. I just didn't have it. So I kind of just floated around. So that's my regret. I wish I wish I would have been able to truly take that opportunity yes. and give it my best. And if they decide to remove me, they decide to remove me and that's okay. But I, I never felt like I had given this roster my best. Not far, far from it. And that's... Yes. That's a bit of a regret in some shape or form. I mean, just from the chronology you explained there, of it, I can see how in the bigger picture, it just seems stupid, doesn't it? You grind all these fucking hours doing your job and your degree and playing CS. And then when finally you're like, right, whew, I'm basically finished with the degree. So now I can just focus on CS. It's like, ah, that's the end of your career as a T1 Pro because you come back a rogue later. But like, yeah, that kind of was it. Like the joke yeah. was it actually, as we'll get to now, it was the transition analyst work after that. But yeah, the stupid thing is you never really got to know there's a lot of what ifs in your career. What would have happened if at this time period I could have put like a solid year in on a top team, right? Maybe. Uh, absolutely. I, I think if I had a different mentality, if I had been stronger mentally speaking as well, um, I would, obviously I, I didn't mention it, but I was also at the time uh, I I uh, separated from a long-term relationship I had. So it was it was a whole right. sort of whirlwind of emotions. And I was a, I was a 25-year-old not really immature, but I was a 25-year-old lost and tired guy who made plenty of bad decisions in a while. And I just, like, I was in a tornado and I, I couldn't keep track. I really couldn't keep track. So, yeah, I wish, I wish I could see what would happen if I actually had my head screwed on a bit tighter on my shoulders and I could really put in the work and see where we go with this. I'm curious to see, I would have been curious to see what would have happened. And that's also, this experience here is part of the reason why when I go back to LDLC much later, if we even talk about it, I'm a different person. I'm a completely different person. I'm a different player. Um, and I do much better because I, uh, fortunately, I learned from this experience. Right. I've told this story before. We might even have talked about it on an episode at some point in time, but I'll frame it this way in case people didn't watch that. They're watching this interview to get to know about you. Famously, when you did take the step back, this is actually one of those rare moments where I sort of like let the mask drop and I show the humanity behind the monster, as it were. Because actually, famously, I've told people, I don't do this to every player. You won't see me when certain players, I think are just average players with not great minds, retire. I don't do what everyone else does, which is just go on the desk. You can have a job on the desk, right? But I tell you what, you can go find the tweet. I actually did do that to me. I actually did say, basically, it's time for you to join us on the desk. Because I actually did know you are someone who has more depth than just frags on the server and if people don't know what you did was at the end of this period when you didn't have a team you did a few events you some ESL you did like a star series a fucking they did like two or three events I remember and then we knew at the time though because then while this was going on you got the envious coaching job so we knew like okay it's only a temporary thing for now but I remember even just from those first events like look if you went back down I'm sure you'd cringe you'd be way more raw and you didn't have the banter and that you weren't as polished but even so I think if someone actually has the eye they could already see there was something there like, like I say you weren't just a certain I won't say which names but so like when someone would just put like an entry fragger on there, like, I don't know, man, I mean, in practice, I'm sure they're winning, but like just generic, you know, spurious points. Like you were actually giving good analysis. You were breaking the game down. Did you have any sense at the time? Like this could be a pivot too. Maybe this can be a gig. Well, I, I will say that I didn't really imagine, or I wasn't really ready to imagine a long-term perspective because I was very much firmly set on trying to still be a player. Right. So it's like I had sort of like the, I was tunnel visioned a little bit at the time. But what I can say is that I saw firsthand that I was enjoying myself in these moments, although there was a fair amount of pressure because when you're not used to it, suddenly you're, you're on a freaking desk with cameras and lights all over you and makeup and all, and it takes a little bit of time to get yourself loose and, and enjoy yourself. But I could feel like, oh, wait a minute, this is kind of cool, actually. This lets me be a part of the community. It gets me to talk about the game, which I've always had. Like, I have a real genuine passion for the game itself, tactically and for players, and an appreciation for good players and good plays, and this checks all the boxes, right? This this allows me to explore all of the all of these interests at once. So, I at the time I wasn't really ready to imagine like, oh, you know what? This is actually going to be my life. But I guess I I I quickly understood like this is a good time. This is this is a very good time, and that's why when the offers came around later, right. I I knew I had to jump on it because I had already this first experience where I felt like, wait a minute, like right. this is kind of cool, and the camaraderie with the talents is pretty cool. People were nice to me as well, and I think the the 
the reaction from the community, the very early reaction of the community was also a little bit, as you just said, like, oh, it's not, I'm just showing up to say, oh yeah, that was a good B execute. Like I had something to say and people were interested in what I had to say on account of me being an ex-professional player. So it was kind of the perfect storm for me to, to kind of fill a gap there. Right, after this, before you played again, like I say, you did get this brief period where you coached Envious, right? Here's the problem, Maniac. Normally, I would just ask a straight-up question. How do you evaluate your coaching? Were you going to... But first of all, this is when even the term coach, it isn't like Zonic now, guys. You don't have, like, roster control, and then you're benching people, and then you're telling, like, some star player, hey, like, I'm not going to accept that from you. Like, coach at the time, the joke is, it's almost like half almost like a manager, you're just sort of helping the players get comfortable. And then you do a bit, you're sort of like almost the analyst. You help the, the IGL with some yes. input, but at the end of the day, he can overrule you and say whatever. Now, the real problem here is, the reason I'm not going to ask how will you just generate coaching is because, bro, you fucking know how to pick them in your career, some of the decisions you've made. I think you picked the most uncoachable team in the history of Counter-Strike because, first of all, people might know Happy didn't even give a fuck what people's, like, shocks thought about CS. Like, the idea he was going like, to let you tell him he's wrong or don't force by I don't know about that. And then also, this was the year again where, because he's had, like, that banger, they finally won the major, Kenny S. He just was falling in, I can tell you, man. I don't remember him back then. Even had that girlfriend he was like, always fucking partying with. Like, this is an era when, like... Like, you'd have to be Zonic, I think, to fix a team like this. You'd have to be some, like, fucking... And you'd have to have insane buy-in, I feel like. Because when I look at this year, people might remember this is the year Envious ran into the ground and it was kind of sad and they were even, they mm. couldn't even come last place at a tournament or they could just blow against... You know, before the joke was, Happy did break the meta. He was actually wrecking all the best teams in the world. Give me some thoughts on this time period. Like, how did Maniac's um, personality fit in this bunch? So what happened was like, you're, you're talking about sort of Envious running to the ground late 2015, and that's the context in which I was contacted. So I was contacted by NBK in a sort of transition of power where NBK would become the leader of Envious, Happy would take a step back, and NBK would want me by his side to coach the team, right? So that's that's the premise. That's how I've been approached. And then um, I'm trying to put that out correctly. What I realized a little bit later as well was that one, I was completely unprepared to do that kind of job and I, and I didn't actually put the, the effort in to sort of be ready to do that kind of job, even though I had, even though I had a, a, a clear ID and very strong concepts of like psychology and a good mind for the game, which you would think are pretty good assets and weapons to be a coach. There's a, a whole aspect of the, the relationship and the types of relationship you have with players that I hadn't really considered. And I was not, ready to not be one of them and you know what i mean it's like I, when you join a team like that and you've been playing with some of these people a part of me wasn't ready to let go of me being a player playing with these guys so it's it's doomed it's doomed I mean, put it it's way, people work. often say there needs to be like a distance between coach and yes. player right and there here the distance was absolutely non-existent right. mainly because of me like i was still trying to i i hadn't really p purely given up on being a player and I, I wasn't so the way I would frame it is that this had all the elements of an absolute crash and catastrophe because on one hand the team was dysfunctional to the deepest level you could possibly imagine as in I'm talking about stopping practice two days into a boot camps because the practices are going so bad that that's how it's how bad I'm talking so p very very dysfunctional team huge issues between members a uh, huge disagreement on on the the type of counter strike that needs to be played what's the philosophy that, you can imagine whatever you want to imagine all of these problems all being put together on one hand and then two an inexperienced coach because i had after all zero experience coaching people although i was a, and i still am a licensed psychologist no experience coaching people whatsoever and coaching people for whom i do not have the healthy distance necessary to to make decisions and on top of that zero executive power zero executive decision power at all so what I realized is I was basically brought in to be like a like a puppet. Uh, basically, NBK would try to feed me ideas that I would then try to put on the other players so it would be sort of legitimized. That's what I realized then. And when I got to that conclusion after three months, I just said, you know what, let's stop it here. Like, I'm, I'm not bringing you guys much. This is going nowhere. Why are we doing this? So I think this was obviously a failure on all accounts. And I bear some responsibility in that for sure because I don't think I fully considered what it would mean to be a strong coach but then again I'm looking back 
I'm looking back at it now with my vision of what coaching is today. And I think this is a little bit, it's not exactly fair because at the time, as you say, coaching was a bit more like some coaches were just managers, some yes. coaches were more analysts. <clears throat> and I thought maybe, oh, well, actually, I, I have a pretty good mind for the game and I'm, I'm pretty decent at human contacts and I know these people. So maybe it's going to work out. It's not like I just rocked in my shorts and was just trying to steal paychecks. I actually thought I could do something for them. I just realized I couldn't. Or at let, least me ask not you, in this way. let me ask you a follow-up segue question, though, because the sad thing is, when you were actually saying earlier about your background in psychology, I even realized if you could have sort of been integrated properly, you could have been like an OP coach because you not only could have done some yep. of the tactical stuff, you actually could have like been the sports psych. At the time, people don't know there were no sports psychs in fucking teams. Like That wasn't even a dream. So, But one thing I always did want to ask you is this. The reason why I also felt it was a little bit inappropriate, specifically for this team, though, mate, is this team had the biggest egos you can ever get in Counter-Strike. And like you say, they're in a bad shape. Like they're, they're already having battles. So like, look, I'm not, I don't want to paint it like you or just roll over when everyone talks to you. But if you're going to have to be pretty forceful and confident in yourself to sort of battle some of these guys, right? I imagine it's pretty tough. Yes. And also it, it would have been one thing if I had been a coach for five years and then suddenly they ask me and right. I have certainties and I know what it is I'm doing and I can actually just meet them head on. There, I was just kind of figuring out, like, okay, how is this going to work? Like, okay, am I going for confrontation here, or should I just try to defuse the situation? I was also sort of walking on eggshell, making sure, like, okay, is this okay here? I, I absolutely did not have the authority necessary and the distance with the players necessary to make the calls that were needed. And as you say, I also wasn't really given the power either. So the whole situation was cut from the very beginning, right? When a player comes to you asking to be their coach, it, it, it is all... From the very beginning, the bases are unhealthy and sort of uh, janky, if you ask me. Like, it's not the same as if someone from Envious, like the CEO of Envious, came sure. to me and said, listen, we, would, we, we need you to kind of direct this team right now. You're going to come like top down from our side and you're going to help the boys. And then I would show up and be like, well, listen, the boss, he, I'm here with, from the boss, so let's try work this together. I was brought in from within, from the players. And I think this was highly unhealthy and part, part of the reason why I didn't do much for them they didn't they didn't do much for themselves either and we just went our separate ways by the way one thing i want to ask about is you were obviously after this team you came back as a player and you were briefly in this rogue team which the question's not going to be as much about that team the obvious question i have is this the famous name in that team because he also was a journeyman i was obviously cadian right mm -hmm. what was it like to play with cadian in 2016 that sounds quite <laughs> unusual right yeah, it was unusual. I would say he was uh, he was very eager. He was he, he reminded me a little bit of Apex. Like he was quite explosive, like personality wise in the game as well. Uh, he was very invested. He he would burn out on energy, basically hyperactive type people. Uh, but it was a pretty short stint as well. Uh, once we once we negotiated the rogue deal, we, we just went our separate ways as well. Um, but I think we were there was no real deep connection. We were all just bound by the same will to keep on being relevant and to keep on playing Counter-Strike and trying to sort of fight your way through the jungle of, hey, let's try to get a contract, let's try and get this shit rolling together. You know, you're testing players and you're basically testing six different lineups over seven weeks. We're just trying to figure out, okay, who are we going to play with? Who are we going to keep? Where do we go? What competition? And at the end of the day, you never really do any meaningful work because you're just doing patchwork and sort of on-the-fly strategies and, and chisel. But it was a funny experience to to meet Cadian on that and to see firsthand like how yeah he's he's a little bit apex ish in his way of going about the game like wholeheartedly maybe a little bit over the top at times not always the easiest personality to work with but very invested that's for sure. So as you referred to earlier, one of the last sort of like big runs of your career was you came back to LDLC, the org that you'd all made your name with, because at this time, this is when existence got kicked from G2 and he went down a level. And the premise was, right, he's going to find these talents. So infamously, there was Alex from the UK scene. At the time, was just a player, but obviously could speak French. And then you had the, I would say he was the problem child of the Belgian scene. It was Twainu, if people don't know. Twainu, yeah. This guy clearly had talent. He was an opera, but he also was like ridiculously streaky. Like he could just have a game where he just goes cold completely and it looks terrible so there was like some pieces here you've got you you've got fucking existence like when you look back at what was this experience like in this team um overall it was a pretty positive experience for multiple reasons uh the first being when i when i get the call that they would like to recruit me i still remember i was at the assembly winter which is like a regional land in Helsinki. i was helping out a team i was standing in for a team there and then existence called me and asked me if i wanted to go back to the team and I felt like 
But first of all, that was a professional contract. So you have to imagine esports kept on developing and then sure. they were actually offering me, like funnily enough, they offered me more money than I had in Titan, which is crazy because, to think where we were. Because of, it's a year or two later, yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. Because like, this money had scaled in 2015. If yeah, it's, it's yeah, three sure. years later. So it's 2017, that's three years later. So right. even though LDLC is like a journeyman, top yes. 20 to 30 team, their salary is already above what we had in Titan at the That's time. Cool. So I'm just like, oh my yeah. God, Jesus Christ, I can actually pay my bill. Yeah. And on top of that, I really felt like this was an opportunity for me to redeem myself from the catastrophe of the end of Titan. So I truly felt like I was on a mission to prove to myself and to existence that I can do it again. And when I joined LDLC, and I, I'm very clairvoyant and lucid and fair with myself, but I basically turned into the perfect teammate. Like for, for the whole year, I was... okay fucking on top of everything. I was doing a crazy amount of deathmatch. I was watching all the demos. I was always serious. I was always pushing the players. I, I was doing everything. So this was, it, it was a, almost like a therapeutic experience for me because I sort of proved to myself that I could do it if I was doing it the right way. I could do it again and I sort of redeemed myself and it got me also very closer to existence again because we, we didn't really leave on good terms in, in mid-2015 because why would he not be pissed at me and sure. I would be pissed at them because they kicked me. It was all left in sort of a murky situation and this was very therapeutic to be back together again, uh, sort of swallow the humble pill, go back in the ladders, play the open qualifiers, be happy because you play a freaking DreamHack Open Denver, be happy because nice. you play the ESWC, and just have to grind your way through because you want it. And because if you want it, you got to do the job. You're going to grind the shit out of the deathmatch and all of that. And this was a very positive experience for me. In, even though there were a bunch of frustration and frustrating results, it was a very positive experience for me as a person to kind of, again, redeem myself. Right. After this, obviously, then you made the proper pivot into doing events. Now, what people won't know, because I notice people, just like with players, they always think if you're good now, you're always good. And if you're bad now, you're always bad. Like they just retcon all your history. So the joke is now people are going to know you're one of the absolute best analysts in the game. But the first year you came back in 2018, when you were doing the events, if people don't know, you actually were on the outskirts again and you had to work you in just like a player works with the top. Like if people don't know, I will say the best example is back then the most ruthless one was Star Series. Star Series would really, bring analysts and then the joke is some of you did just go home after like the Swiss system and then you know the three of us or whatever stayed for the playoffs and so there used to be a very obvious divide of who's going home and who's staying for the whole event so at the time there was really a hierarchy in tears for me it's the online era that messed everything up so at this time like you've got to climb you in I know on the people might know on the commentator side famously some of the best commentators would even say like now oh, what's the point I can never make it there's Anders and Schemler and there's Shadik and, and there was a perception of hierarchy right when you came to do this job and you were finally like committing to doing it I I actually feel like back then you were actually maybe not that confident when you began. You always seemed a little bit like a little bit unsure. Did you even think you were the best? Like to me, there was always the potential there. What were you like when you first came back? Do you think? Um, well, I, I think you're right. I think my own self confidence came around with with work and working more events and also fitting out my relationship with TOs is improving and people are trusting me on the long term. I think at the very beginning, um, the talent life. So, so there's there's a few things that one has to consider. First of all. Since I came in as a, an ex-professional player, I didn't really know the people from the talent side. Like people were very nice to me and I've always felt very accepted and people were very uh, amicable to me and nice, but I didn't really have a, like a very strong social support net or whatever it is. Like I was kind of lost at the very beginning trying to figure out my way. Okay, wh who am I hanging out with? Who are the people I can trust? Who can I not trust? Trying to, you know, figure out your way. So from a social standpoint, it was a little bit a bit of anxiety throughout it. And also just working the camera. I think earlier on, I was basically just a, an ex-professional player talking about Counter-Strike and that's it. Like That's how I started. Right. I started because I had, obviously I had a an eye for the game and an understanding of the game. And even though English is a secondary slash tertiary language for me, I already had a good vocabulary enough or vocabulary good enough that I could explain myself in an intelligible way and I could make full sentences and I was pretty good at expressing myself. So that helped me. But the very beginning is just me talking about Counter-Strike. And this went on, I would say, probably until the online era where I was not exactly sure where am I standing with the TOs, who wants to work with me in the future, who sees promise in me for the future, for whom am I just like a second, third, fourth options? That lasted for about a year and a half where you have to imagine, I, I sometimes I'm not even sure how I can pay my bill. Like one of my best friends lent me money 
to pay for my apartment at some point. Okay. Because I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't pay for my apartment because it was in between. And, you know, famously at the time, some TOs were taking 65 days to pay you. So you would oh, never know sure, when you yes. get paid. Yes. And so I had moments where a, a friend of mine actually lent me money to pay for my apartment. So this was a, a very stressful moment. And I, I, fortunately enough, kept having events here and there. Blast was really the first TO that came to me and said, listen, we're going to work with you regularly. Like, we like what you do. We're going to work with you regularly. And I think... The online era was a moment where I grinded so much the broadcast, uh, <coughs> ca casting, even casting games, uh, doing whatever the hell event that is on, on single analyst positions with one host. Um, I even drove to Copenhagen 15 hours in my car because there were no flights during COVID times just to be there three weeks to be their analyst for some event. And that gave me so much airtime so much airtime that I started being a bit more comfortable. I started messing around a little bit, allowing myself to sort of feel a little bit more free. And I kind of broke through after this, like off the back of the COVID area, when we got back to LAN, uh, Blast was the first CEO to tell me, listen, you are going to be our guy. We're going to give you a year contract. And that to me, uh, it was almost like a click where I started feeling like, okay, I have their trust. I am going to now allow myself to explore a little bit more, what can I do? I just I don't want to be just a talking head about the game. I want to be able to have fun, be a be a venter, doing a bit of history about the players, trying to maybe be a bit more poetic. I remember you had a tweet one day where you said, "The day a maniac realizes he's not an analyst but he's a poet, it's over." And I just read that tweet and I was like, "It's a pretty good no, line, isn't it? It's a pretty good line, he's man." Not, he's not that wrong, you know. I should really lean into like this. I, I like to embellish. I like to talk yes. about. Uh, trajectories and lores and what it means, what are the stakes for every game, trying to help people understand what's happening in the game. And I started feeling really comfortable at it. And it was really during Blast that I experimented. I'm going to try to be a bit more out there, a bit more extrovert on the desk, having a bit more fun. And it created a very virtuous cycle where people were very receptive to it. The, the, the vibes were pretty positive. Forums, Reddit, HLTV were very nice with me. And I felt sort of more emboldened by it as I felt more courageous and brave and I and it started it created sort of this vibe where I started taking more space on desks and then there was the first major of course it, things things my my progression was probably helped both helped by the online era but also kind of slowed down because you have to imagine my first major is 2021 yes because we've had no major for so long so when we worked the major together in Stockholm that's my first major I, I haven't done a major before that so I, I'm kind of impressed i'm at the desk with with you and yanko and richard um i'm still like i'm the young kid on the block still although i've been doing right. it for i've been doing it for two or three years at the time but in terms of ma uh, major i'm the young kid right and now i look back and i see all the, the sort of the path that i've been on and how i've improved as a person and as an analyst but it, it didn't come overnight it, it it took quite some time for me to really blossom into this role and and to start appreciating because right now i appreciate every second I'm on the desk because I feel so much more comfortable about messing around and what if an asset doesn't come when I ask for it and if a microphone doesn't work out and if we have to fill for an hour, it doesn't matter. We'll we just talk about the game. We're going to be fine. I wasn't always like that. It took me a while. Yeah, the funny thing is, even though I have taken certain people, you, others aside, and tried to sort of tell them what, in my opinion, is the secret to broadcast, which is... I think everyone starts and because they're starting like in any job, you start off as like, well, I don't know anything. So I'm going to like learn from these people who are really good. And people tend to try and just be a knockoff version of whoever they think the best analyst or caster is, right? Whereas what I noticed a long time ago is the real secret, like I say, to becoming actually really big, but also getting an essential value is find out what makes you different, what's going to set you apart. So famously, if people don't know, they wouldn't actually get this. They'll think it's just like the bunch. Or, no, if I had to describe what I did, a very simple concept is this because I was a mega fan and they were very, very kind to people on the broadcast when I first came to the couch, right? Because it tended to be two two play-by-play -play casters who didn't like have a deep analytical nod. They were just saying everyone was awesome and everyone at the top of the scoreboard was great and every kill was brilliant. So I wanted to be the guy who said the things that fans are thinking, but no one sell the broadcast. Like, you know what? Yeah, that guy was actually shit in that game. Or you know what? They Forget just like, you know, can they re rehabilitate this player? Maybe they'd replace him. I wanted to be like, I said, I, I was a fan of English football punditry where I can tell 
tell you, mate, they brutalise the defence when they play badly in a game or, you know, a team loses a cup final they're supposed to win. So that was my unique thing is essentially I'd sort of say the things other people can't say. I would say pimps, if people don't know, when the moment he started transforming from a generic analyst is when he became the first one to do that thing where he'd keep a tally of how many, like, entry kills someone had, like Stewie 2K famous he'd do it for. Oh, in 11 rounds, he got the opening kill on seven of them. He found his own angle to sort of make his analysis. Have. In yours, right? I think you you nailed it by bringing up that tweet. Even though people would think it's like the fact you're like, you balance the desk or, you know, you obviously you have a very professional sheet. I actually think, to go back to what you said earlier, you clearly just love Counter-Strike. You were a fan of playing and even watching, which is quite rare for pros, by the way, to watch it if you're not an IGL is normally not what they do. And to me, what you've been able to do the best is using your vocabulary and your intelligence and the fact that you are a, a more worldly person, you've gone through your life and you have a degree and you've done jobs. You use that to actually sort of like, as we say in English, wax lyrical. Like, I think that's when you're at your best, mate, is when you're not just talking about like, you know, Zewu had 17 kills here and four up. It's like, no, yours is like, it's the art of what he's doing or his imagination as he's doing. I think you've actually brought a different dimension to fans in that sense. Normally, if you did that and you weren't as classy, I think it might just come off as fanboyism. But I think actually you've yeah. sort of nailed the professional way to do that, mate. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. And I appreciate these are these are high praises, by the way. But yeah, this is where I found my own way of of sort of refining my own craft. And I, I don't believe there is someone that really does that currently in the no, space. No. But I had, as you say, I had influences, right? And I think part of it, uh, once you realize that, hey, this is the job that I want to do, then I have to treat it as a skill that I want to refine and I want to be better at it. And it's much different than just showing up and getting a good paycheck and talking about Counter-Strike and going home. You, you have to make a commitment at some point that, okay, I am now a broadcast talent. It is a job and that job entails different departments. In some, I'm comfortable. In some, I'm not. So what can I do to better myself in some? Or what, what kind of decisions? How do I want to position myself? And I had a few influences around. I mean, I was always a big fan of how you were capable of setting up the historical context of any matches that's happening. Because as a fan of the game and as a fan of, for example, football, I used to watch football a lot. I Maybe I didn't even know it at the time, but I already had sort of a, a curiosity for panels and desk or whatever. It was really even called desk. But I would love to watch a game and understand what does it mean. Oh, why is Liverpool versus AC Milan an interesting matchup right now? Why did they play? Oh, they played last year. Wow. And oh, this player, he wasn't that team before. Wow, he's playing against his former teammate. That's crazy. Oh my God, he scored again. I, I was already touched by it and it made me more engaged in the game. And then this is what you could do. You were capable of doing that. You were capable of sort of retracing the steps of players and where they were going and what it means. And so I thought, okay, what I need to do is I need to give the viewers something that they would not get otherwise if I wasn't here. What is it? Uh, it's my empathy. It's my ability to tell you this is what the players is feeling right now. Because I was a player and I'm pretty decent with words. So I'm going to help you be in his shoes. How does he feel in that clutch? How do they feel after this win? How do they feel after this loss? What does that mean for the team? What are the stakes? That's what I had to work on. But it took a lot of work. And uh, you have to... S something that people have to realize as well when, when we do this job as talent is that you are putting yourself out there into the world and you are very vulnerable per se. You can decide to be impacted by it or not. It is in your power. But when I go on the desk, I might be maniac, but it is who I am that I'm, that I'm showing up on the desk. It's my passion for the game. It's my respect for players. If, if there are 50 forum threads that says, get this fucking clown out the desk, this is bullshit. This would break you. This would, yeah. uh, this would, would break you right because it's people just basically saying you are like this is not enough you're insufficient we don't want you they're rejecting you right exactly it's there's a form of rejection that can yeah. be felt and you have to be ready for it yes and if you want to have a career in this job you have to be able to walk the line where you listen to criticism because i don't think imagining that you are perfect yourself i don't think is a healthy nor nor a fruitful sort of perspective but you have to be able to clean up and filter out the people who just spew vile or venom at you and it's a tough line it's not always that easy um but the i think the only reason i made it so far and why i'm thriving now is because I never forced myself to be someone I'm not on the desk. I just found ways to be who I am and be entertaining. And so it's not, I'm not feeling like I have to put on a mask and I don't feel exhausted at the end of events because I just had my, my clown mask on and I can take it off. I am me. This is who I am on the desk. If I, if I vibe for a team, if I'm frustrated on the desk or if I'm bored or if I'm laughing, that, that's me. That's who I am. I just had to make it entertaining and, and sort of engaging for the viewers. And if you find a way to do that, then you can 
going day in, day out for 12 hours a day and you're going to be fine. But it, it takes a, it takes a, a lot of work. And also you have to be open to the possibility that people are not going to like you. Yes. And you're going to try, you're going to give your best and people are not going to like you. And that can happen. One of the things I think is quite funny and almost it's almost like uh, asymmetrical is in your career, like I described, I actually think you had a lot of bad luck, but I, I will say part of that is because, sadly, I think as a pro player, if you are the one where when they do the sort of Game of Thrones, Lord of the Flies element of people picking players out and kicking people and going to other teams and all the Game of Thrones behind the scenes, if you don't play that, it's like that famous quote in English that says, if you don't have a plan, you will become part of someone else's plan. Yeah. Actually, unfortunately, the players who tend to chill back and be less controversial actually tend to get fucked over in all those deals and all those swaps and they're the one left behind and the, the joke is in the analyst world I actually think that quality you have of being more neutral and not being the guy ever involved has helped you bro because if I look at the last three years when you've been in your prime I you, you might be the only analyst to do every one of the really bigger you did every major every kind of Vizze, every cologne all the blasts including so essentially you had actually what every analyst would want all the events were there for you and part of it you can tell me i feel like part of it is there is an always an element of like maintaining relationships with these tos or what role do you play for them some of the other people have gambled sometimes and won or lost big some of them have had times where they were with one org and then whether with the other how give me a sense of this how have you managed it because it seems like so far to me you and Freya are the ones that have almost done it perfectly i've never seen you mm. ever involved in any drama but you all get all the events and everyone thinks you're awesome you do a great job so how have you done this <laughs> So the way I would answer you is that I have, I have made this decision consciously a long time ago that I would give up on immediate returns for like flary tweets and drama okay. for a long term growth and becoming for the for, for tos I want to be this reliable guy that is going to be excellent all the time. I might not be the top of Reddit because I'm not going to make a, an incredible statement that is going to create an incredible conversation. I will do that if I feel sometimes it is necessary or not, but I've always thought I'm going to for I'm going to give up on that side of the business just so I can always be good. And I'm going to keep myself out of trouble. I'm going to choose my battles and I am going to accept that this is a this is a give and take. I also think honestly I think it's also my personality as as a person, right? Um I I'm not really good with confrontation. I had to I had to work my way through it because part of this business is also being able to sync up with people and would it be production or co-talents or whatever communities, whatever. I had to work my way through it. But it kind of suited me as a person to just, you know what? I'm just going to do my job. I'm just going to do my job. I'm going to talk about Counter-Strike. I'm going to do it to a very good level and I'm not going to really touch the rest. And as I said, it's a give or take. The, the, the negative side of it is that there are very rarely things that I said that become an incredible topic of conversation and just goes on its own. It, it, it becomes almost like a phenomenon on its own and it becomes like this incredible dragon. It doesn't really happen. But on the other side, if I am a TO and I'm organizing an event, I want to be the first name they think of. Right. I want I want them to know, okay, if I'm going to hire a maniac, he, he might never... <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird statement to make. I, I would be fine with being a 9.5 out of 10 my whole life, but I'm never going to be lower than that. I, it's, it's a choice. It's a personal choice. If some people can be 10 one day and 3 the other, I don't want to be that person. I want to be an incredibly reliable, excellent analyst for anybody all the time. That is my, oh, let me rephrase, for anybody I want to work with all the time. And that's how I've sort of navigated the waters of esports. I've been careful not being involved. Uh, for, but first of all, it's also who I am as a person. Um, what's it called? Uh, I, I've never told people how they're supposed to live their life. Right. what they should do or not do. I've never took like a more high ground. It's just not who I am. I, I'm I'm healthily self-centered in the sense of, you know what, I'm just going to live my life. And I'm just going to talk about Counter-Strike. That makes me happy. And this is my way of giving back to the community. I think people can make the case that sometimes as public figure, we should be more involved in XYZ. Fuck off. Like everybody has the right to decide sure. how they want to be involved and how much they want to give from themselves. Yes. We all get to live life according to our own book, our own rules. My way of giving back to the community is respecting, loving the game and being true to the stories that happen at events and doing it with a passion that is pure, authentic, genuine. And that's who I am. And that's it. And that's going to be who I was three years ago. That's going to be who I am in five years. Maybe that means I would never be 
an incredible content creator that creates incredible reactions from the new community, I'm okay with that. I'm at peace with that. That's. I don't think I'm equipped to be that person. I don't want to be that person. Um, I am lucky enough to be in a position right now where I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I still see what I can do better, but I am happy with where I am. And I think that might be a very basic sentence, but I think it's very meaningful. Right. Obviously, a lot of broadcast talent, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, jokingly imply they play at a sort of high level or they could play again. Like, obviously, people like Sponge and Henry will joke every now and then. Here's the difference, guys. I want to let you in on a little secret. Pimp isn't joking. He actually really does think, no joke, even up until a year or two, he still thinks, like, he would even have convos. I'm not even breaking it. I think he's even hinted at this publicly. He would even sort of be like... I wonder if I should keep doing this analysis thing or maybe I come back as a player or he actually, you know, when he does those tweets where he jokes, like, they're going to sign me for Vitality. Look, he obviously doesn't think he's going to join Vitality, but he actually does think he could still be a pro, guys. He thinks he did, like, give that up too early. And I know especially he thinks in Liquid, he sort of, like, took on support roles where he could have been, like, more of a fragger, you know. So part of him, I can tell me, like, on some level, maybe he didn't get to fully live out the pro dream he wanted or he sees it now and he thinks, fuck, that could be me. Like, if people don't know, when he's watching Astralis win all that shit, there is peer group. He's thinking, I used to fucking play against them with some of these guys like why aren't i in there so the obvious question is this maniac do you actually think you could play if like if, if there was no analysis tomorrow look you've got no degree anymore if you applied to, could you be a pro player again could you be in the in, you don't have to be mega but could you be in the tier one scene um i if you gave me if you gave me three to six months to grind the shit out of counter strike on a mechanical standpoint i think i could be a serviceable top 20 team player that's my take okay top 20 not not higher than that um, it would require a crazy amount of work as well. And I see where I see how high the skill ceiling is now for the players who are at the very top. And I'm not delusional that there are there is a level I would never reach. Never right. ever. I could play seven million hours of the game. I wouldn't be Monessi, Donk, or something. <laughs> sure, that's just sure. that's just it. You know, there's like there's no yes. there's not even a point to argue with. But if you told me like, okay, we're gonna need you to be like an anchor, a serviceable support for like a top 20 team. And every now and then you're going to go to an open or a challenger event and then you're going to do the whatever league. Yeah, I think I could. I think I could probably. But there, that, there is a clear glass ceiling that I wouldn't be able to break through. And, and that's completely okay. I mean, the way I look at it now is that it's, it's kind of a weird way, but it's, this, this is the mental gymnastic that I do about it. Some of the regrets that I have about not pursuing my professional career to the best extent or to, to the best of my abilities... This is now the career that I want to be the freaking best in. Right. This is my chance. Like I found something that I know and love and that I can actually uh, really have a long standing effect. And, and in 10 years, maybe people can look back and say, oh, wow, this guy, wow, he worked like 15 majors and he worked all of the Cologne and he was part of the game for so long. And then that is, that's what I want to do now. That this, this is my chance. And right. I'm not going to mess it up. Like this is where I can have my own career. I, I played the game. I achieved some level of greatness in the game. I have incredible memories, incredible moments, friendships and all. But now I have this second lease on my esports career that I can actually become one of the best of all time in what I do. I know it sounds very uh, not uh, humble, but it's the way I look at it. I could be one of the best of all time if I do things correctly over time. And in 10 years, I can look back and say, wow, this guy had an incredible career as a talent. Oh my God, what he brought to the game was insane. He, he was... I feel the same about TV when I watch like professional football or something. I look at this guy and I'm like, wow, I've been watching him for like 15 years. Yes. That's crazy. Like, I feel like he's been in my living room for 15 years. What if one day I can be that person for this different This is something I want to ask as a segment. It's one of the last questions was going to be this, which is, this is what I think is different, mate. I won't say the names, but there are top, top talents. Some even to this day still work the events who in a green room, they'll just straight up tell you, if not by their attitude, that they... They're not, they don't really love analysis. It's a gig for them. Sometimes they like it if it's a big event or it's a hype game. Sometimes they do just go, is it this team against this team again on this map? Oh, boring. Well, let's hope it's a 2-0. Let's get out of here in two hours, you know. Or some of them even do. I mean, Pimp's case, he literally thought it could be a pro. But some of them think, how long do I keep doing this for? Am I going to do it one, two more years? Do I transition and become, you know, I don't know, coach? Do I do something in East? Do I go elsewhere? Do I leave eSports? Right? I actually think the only people who can do like 15, 20, 30, it can be a lifer in eSports. You have to love the game, mate. You have to, I, th I think that, I've always told people, that's the one thing about me. You might think I'm cynical. I fucking love the game. I could watch the, I could watch like Astralis play Team Liquid in 29, like a million times in a row. I'll never get bored. It'll always be interesting. And I think that sustains you, right? So I was going to ask this question to you in similar ways 
as long as everything makes sense, the career, the money, the opportunities, the game size, the game doesn't change or become shit or something. As long as like the basic, you know, the initial conditions are there, Maniac could do this for just the foreseeable future. This could be 10 years. This could be 15 years, right? That's right. I mean, for as long as I will feel fulfilled the way I am now and I will feel the same passion and the same interest that I have for the game, I and, and also that I am wished upon and desired as, as a broadcast talent. That's, that's, there's a side of the equation that I don't have under my control. I can only do my best. But for as long as all of these conditions are met, I'll be around for as long as people want me to be and for as long as I feel good about it. Um, I feel the same about you. I'm not going to lie and stand here and say that every single game of Counter-Strike at every single format and every single TO gets me at the edge of my seat. That's not true. But the deep appreciation of all of the meaningful games is something that I have, that I had, and that I always had for as long as I can remember being 12 year old and watching SK Gaming do uh, Inside Rush on 1.5 Nuke. I, I feel the same. It, it's unwavering. It has never changed. For as long as it's here and it, like, it sustains me, I'm never going to stop. At the end of this interview, do you have a final message? Is someone you'd like to thank or say hello to? Uh, wow. Well, I'll just, I'll just take the opportunity to maybe address the community, right? As I said, um, there are obviously, there will always be people who don't really appreciate what you do and don't like you and let you know that, um, to these people, I also read what you're saying and I will take your comment in consideration as long as it's respectful. Otherwise I'm just going to block the head out of you. Okay. That's how it is. Uh, but I still wanted to thank all of the people that take the time to reach out to me and to let me know that I, that they appreciate my contribution to the game, that they appreciate when they hear me talk about the game. Um, this means a lot. I don't do it only for you. That's wrong, but it helps. Uh, and it is welcome to feel all these positive vibes every time I'm on the camera. And I am very happy to be in the space and I'm happy to help you guys have a good time. Merci beaucoup. You're welcome. Events come and go, fame rises and then falls away. You have a job, you lose a job. You do one thing, you have to move on to another. But one of the cool things about my career is I have my own support network who's always got my back. So I always know I can rely on the support to do the work I want to do and talk the way I want to talk and not have to follow certain rules that others arbitrarily have to follow. And that support group is, of course, called the Skrilluminati, my Patreon community. This video and all the others on my channel was kindly supported by Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Frisky, Ahmed Haju, Tobias Bernasconi, Toucan, Tosh, Jensen Gore, Animosity, and you know it, always my main man Jerky's minion, rock it with me, ride or die. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for a future episode of Reflections or a talk show? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming guests are. Maybe you want to ask me a question for my video AMA where I tend to go quite in depth, or perhaps you want to take part in one of those really long donated discussions where we talk about whatever you're into in esports. Well, if any of those perks or any of the others catch your fancy, join the Skluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box where down below.